Stuka Joe here, and today's game is a magazine game, a game published in the year 2003. So this is a game that is going to be 19 years old this year, and the game appeared in Against the Odds magazine, volume one, number four, and it's Napoleon at the Berezina. This is a game that was intended for solitaire play, where the player controls the Grand Armée retreating in late November from Russia and about to cross the Beresina River with three Russian armies awaiting the French and trying to lay a trap and destroy the Grand Armée. So you are the French player and the rules, not an artificial intelligence system, but a set of rules, controls, the parameters of what the Russians can do. The player has to make some judgment calls for the Russians. So it's not a complete AI, but I really don't mind it at all. I think it works. And we're going to be taking a look at the components and some of the game mechanics. And uh, with one hour, I think we'll be able to cover the essence of this game. And it's still available in the secondary market. And I heard from... Um, Against the Odds magazine that they found some uh, mint copies, and that was in October 2021. I don't know if they still have them. You would have to write to uh, Against the Odds magazine to see if they still have them. I like this game very much. I like the components. I like the topic, and I like the mechanics. I think it is a game that tells a terrific story, and I like Rob Markham's games. If you... Uh, no, he's the guy who designed Raid on St. Nazaire, which is a terrific solo game. So let's take a closer look at Napoleon at the Berezina. And of course, this being a magazine game, it comes in this magazine, which is volume one, number four. And it includes a historical article about the crossing of the Berezina by Robert Markham. The article includes some uh, maps in full color, the stories of General Claude Mallet, and uh, it continues. And here we have an article on Napoleon's Imperial Guard by Andy Nunes. There's uh, an article about Iraq, about uh, Field Marshal Walther Model, and then we reach part of the magazine that has the rules. We have the rule book. The rule book uh, is about 10 pages long. There's optional rules. I like the random events. Uh, I like to incorporate that to the game. And uh, we see the rest of uh, the article on Field Marshal Model. We have an article here, General Jean Baptiste Eble, which is one of the unsung heroes of this campaign. He's the uh, chief of the Engineer Corps there. So you see more maps. And then we reach the last page. And this is, uh, I think, this is the only magazine that I've been subscribed to. Uh, for a long time since issue number two and this is issue number one and recently one of my subscribers gave me as a present issue number one and that's Karsten Engelman so uh, I want to thank you for that again and so I have all the issues of Against the Odds magazine I really like the concept and the games that they cover and uh, I think they take chances in showing innovative games in terms of mechanics in their magazine. There's a lot of different kind of games in the magazine. That's why I like Against the Odds very much. Here we see uh, an unpunched sheet of counters for the game. I have two copies. This is my unpunched copy. And you see the color schemes to denote each formation. So you see that each French core has a different kind of color combination. You see that those in brown there the A5s are, for example, the Old Guard. And the commanders also share the same color scheme. The commander of the Old Guard is Lefebvre. 
We see also step loss markers and uh, you see rabble markers here. Units, uh, when they are eliminated, they are substituted by these rabble markers, which represents uh, just a group of soldiers with no cohesion, which are easy prey for the Russians. And here we see the Russian army. There's three armies, actually, the army of the Danube, Wittgenstein's army, and the main army under Kutuzov. We also see bridge markers. Here, the French army needs to build bridges across the Berezina to cross quickly before all three Russian armies converge on the hapless uh, French army. And the game also brings one letter-sized player aid and cardstock, and it is printed on both sides. This game has a lot of tables. And I don't mind that at all because I like Rob Markham's games because of the narrative aspects of the games. There's a, a story in each game and he tells a great story in this one too. So there's a lot of different kinds of, of, uh, of effects that happen in the tables. You have morale effects, you have combat results. You have to roll to see when, for example, the army of the Danube actually enters and where. So replayability is high because the Russian armies won't enter at the same time nor at the same places. There's also random events if you are playing with that optional rule. And uh, there's also, you have to roll every time you cross a ford. It's very dangerous, but the French have to have their engineer units cross the fords in order to build a bridge so they there's no escaping that so then if they're successful and they cross the ford then they can complete the bridges and that's done by rolling on the engineering table but bridges break down because of use the more units that cross a bridge the, the greater chance that the bridge will break down but then if it breaks down you can repair it with your engineer units now let's take a look at the map this map, I think, is one of my favorite maps of any war game. It's a map that has different shades of blue, and I think it captures uh, very elegantly the situation that uh, Napoleon's army was facing in the Russian winter here. Uh, I just love this map. It's by Craig Grando, so uh, kudos to him. The map... Uh, is uh, from our perspective we are facing east north is this way as shown by that arrow there so we will be seeing the French troops entering the map where that pawn is right there that is hex 6005 and that is a hex with a road that's where all the French units that start outside of the map will enter and that road leads to the town of Bodisov. That town starts under French control and at the beginning of the game we will see that Udinos Corps and that is the second corps will be in Bodisov together with the two French engineer units and the French will be entering the game from turns 3 to 14. This is a 25 uh, turn game. Here we see a French reinforcement schedule that I made for the game. You see that in turn 3 Napoleon and the old guard under Lefebvre entered the game in that hex 6005. Then in turn 6 it's Ney with elements of the 3rd and 5th corps. Then in turn 7, Mortier with the uh, Young Guard. In turn 8, it's Bessier with the uh, Guard Cavalry and Latour Maubourg with elements of the Guard Cavalry Corps. Then turn 9, Junot and units of the 8th Corps. And you see that the uh, letter to the left of the counters is the combat rating for the unit. A is the best. Uh, D is the worst. So you see that, for example, Junot's Corps, as well as Eugène's 4th uh, Corps, that comes in turn 10, has low quality units 
there, and those are divisional size units by the two x's that you see there. Then you see, for example, in turn 12, Victor with his ninth core enters the game, and most are it's brigade. And then in turn 14, it's Davu with units of the first core, which are in pretty bad shape, as denoted by that C rating. Here we see the units that begin the game on the map, and I also did this setup card to make it easier to set up the game. The Russians always set up first, and we have elements of the Army of the Danube, two commands. We have uh, first Chlaplatz command, which sets up on the west side of the Berezina within four hexes of hex 1914. Here we see hex 1914, and we see with the little post hex 2013, where at least one unit has to be placed. And notice the uh, Ford symbol there in the hex side between 2013 and 2012. There are very few Ford hex sides in the game. French units can only cross at Ford hex sides, but they have to risk rolling on the Ford crossing table. And to avoid that, the French can construct bridges over these Ford hexides, but it takes time to do so. And uh, time is an element that the French don't have the luxury of wasting in this game. The other elements of the Army of the Danube that set up on the map at the beginning of the game are those of Langeron's command. And these set up within three hexes of hex 5514, and a unit has to set up at least in hex 5613. And here we see hex 5514 and its vicinity. That hex represents the village of Dinki. And you see that there is that hex 5613 that has to be occupied. There's another Ford symbol there. And across to the east is the town of Borisov that starts under French control. And after the Russians set up their units, then the French set up Oudinot and his second corps. And they set up within two hexes of any hex of Borisov, east of the Berezina. And then the Eble and Chaselu engineer combat units set up in any hex in Borisov. So the French will be setting up in and around Borisov with uh, an eye towards the north, which is to the left, in order to try to get those two engineer units to a uh, Ford crossing. And let's take a look at the Ford crossings in this game. There's the one that we saw there uh, near Borisov. If we continue on a northerly direction, we find that there is another Ford crossing here between hexes 4215 and 4315 and we continue along the Berezina River and we find that Ford crossing that we saw before between 2012 and 2013 and further to the north the north edge of the map there's two uh, Ford crossings near Veselovo and also Kostuikoi. So those are all the Ford crossings and the French in this game uh, once a non-engineer unit crosses the Berezina the French then have to decide which exit point they will use to exit their army from the map. And there are various exit points and we'll take a look at those now. Here we see near the Ford Hexide near Borisovo, there is an exit point here in hex 1619. The problem with that particular exit point for the French is that there's going to be a large contingent of Russian forces around these two emplacement hexes here near Dimki. So this is going to be a very tough proposition. Now, assuming that the French cross in force here, in that Ford hex side between 4215 and 4315, the nearest exit points 
to the west are in the woods here. And you see two of them. And you can see there's uh, trails that lead outside of the woods. So at least the units can take advantage of those trails. But it's a long way from that particular ford crossing. Also to the northwest of that ford crossing there is another exit here also in another wooded area that's hex 3327. Now if the French decide to cross near Studianka they would have to deal with any Russian forces near Brilovo and there's going to be Russian forces there and then they would have to push to the north and exit here at Hex 1013. So this game presents several challenges for the French player. He has to move quickly, choose a crossing uh, space, and then cross in force, and then he will have to have units with enough strength to be able to attack and uh, push back any Russian defenders. And the problem for the French is compounded because of the weather conditions. During each turn, the French player will be rolling on uh, the morale effects table. Here we see the morale effects table, and depending on the unit's combat rating, is the possibility of a unit receiving an unfavorable result. For example, units may abandon treasure. All units are assumed to be carrying loot in this game, and uh, if you abandon loot at the end of the game for each such marker the French lose a victory point and then there's an even worse result which is SL which represents a step loss for the French units. One of the most interesting mechanics of this game is the way that the game handles Russian morale and Russian morale is handled through this morale track and uh, according to specific circumstances morale will increase. It starts the game in this S or start space and what that indicates is the uh, combat rating of all Russian forces uh, when it is in that box is D which is the worst. Foot units have a movement allowance of one and cavalry units have a movement allowance of two but when the French cross the Beresina for the first time the marker will start moving each turn one box to the right. So you see there's no change here with the second box, but uh, once we reach this third box, we see that the uh, foot unit's uh, movement allowance increased to two and the cavalry to three. And it will continue to improve throughout the game. And you see, for example, if it reaches this box here, the uh, combat rating of all Russian units will be C and the movement allowances will be 3 and 4 for infantry and cavalry respectively and it can even reach this box here on the extreme right where uh, all Russian units would be A units and uh, combat rating in this game is a lettered base uh, A units fire before B units so fire here is not simultaneous but sequential and here we see the combat results table. So an A unit that is firing also has a better chance of inflicting a hit on an enemy unit that is uh, rolling three to six with one die. Conversely, D units only score hits on sixes. But the information that you will see on Russian combat units is always a T on the left side, meaning that its combat strength or combat rating will be based on the Russian morale track. So that let's the Russian morale marker is currently in the number four box in combat. All Russian units, including the one that I just showed you, would have a combat rating of C. And the C uh, that you see to the right hand side is the form of movement that this unit uses. It's cavalry movement. The other units that uh, move differently in the game are foot units and those are denoted by the letter F. 
So continuing with our example here, that Russian cavalry unit would move up to three movement points as denoted here by the rating for cavalry units in the current Russian morale track box. And foot units would have a movement allowance of two. Now another consideration in this game is how units take step losses. Units can take up to four step losses before being eliminated. Let's say that that foot unit that we see on the left takes its first step loss. We place a step loss marker beneath that unit to signify that it has taken one step loss. Now let's say that it takes a, step, a second step loss. We remove the step loss marker and we flip the unit to its reduced side. And notice now that the combat rating has changed to a minus one. That means that the unit, the unit now has a combat rating of one level less than the current combat level on the Russian morale track. So if the current level is C, the combat strength for that particular unit would be D. And if the unit takes a third hit, we place a step loss marker beneath that unit. And on a fourth hit, Russian units are eliminated. Now French units behave a little differently. They can absorb four step losses, in which case they would be eliminated. So let's say that this unit is at reduced strength and with a step loss marker beneath it. And it suffers another step loss. Well, the unit would be eliminated. So we would remove the unit and in its place we would place a rabble marker. And rabble uh, represents just a group of soldiers with no cohesion, just walking and trying to save themselves. And uh, the effect of becoming rabble is that any Russian unit that moves adjacent to a rabble marker causes that rabble marker to disintegrate. A unit is eliminated instantly and the Russians score victory points for eliminating French rabble. Now in this game all French combat units are assumed to be carrying treasures that they looted from Russia and the way the game signifies that is by having the unit facing upright as you see the unit here and uh, uh, a result of AT on the French morale table can cause a unit to abandon its treasure in which case we would place an abandoned treasure marker and then the unit would be rotated 180 degrees. Now I specifically don't like that. I like uh, to have all units upright. So what I will be doing is we will have all French units that are carrying their treasure signified by the uh, uh, wooden tile underneath the French unit so it's visible that this particular unit is carrying treasure and if the unit suffers an abandoned treasure result then we just simply place the abandoned treasure marker in the hex and we leave the unit uh, upright and uh, you, the unit will continue then moving at a later turn and the abandoned treasure will uh, remain in the hex. Okay, let's set up the units that start on the map. The Russians set up first. There's two commands of the army of the Danube. The first command is that of Schlapplatz, and it sets up within four hexes of hex 1914, and a unit has to set up in hex 2013. Here we see hex 1914, the village of Brilovo. So let's set up the units in the vicinity within four hex. And here we see Chaplat's command after setup. They placed uh, an artillery unit in that hex 2013 where they have to set up at least one unit. Artillery units have a range of up to three hexes and uh, the artillery unit has an infantry unit beneath and they're guarding that uh, hex side there 
that uh, faces uh, Studianka, that's uh, affordable hexite. Now we set up Langeron's command, and it sets up within three hexes of hex 5514, and one unit at least has to go into hex 5613. So here we see the pawn in hex 5514, and setup has to be within three hexes of that hex on the west side of the Berezi. And here we see the units of Langeron's command, including two units set up in hex 5613, an artillery and an infantry unit, which are guarding that Ford hexite. Now, each of these commands of the Army of the Danube that start on the map begin frozen, and we will signify that by placing this marker near the leader here, and we'll check the rules of how these units are released. And also the command of Langeron starts frozen, so we place our frozen marker there. Now units of the Army of the Danube are released whenever a French combat unit crosses the Berezina, but it's not automatic. The uh, player has to roll on the Danube activation table until a released result is obtained. Let's take a look at that table. Here we see the Army of the Danube activation table. Let's say that a French unit in turn four crosses the Danube. During the Russian uh, part of turn four, the Russian player can roll, and the Russian player would roll on the zero column, meaning the same turn when the French unit crossed. And you see that the Russians need a six in order to release the units of the Army of the Danube, so it's going to be very unlikely. But then the Russian player would roll again in turn number four using the one column, and in turn number five, the two column, turn number six, the three column, and from turn seven onwards, if the army of the Danube has not been released yet, uh, the Russians will roll on the four column, and you see that the chances of obtaining a release result increase with each turn. So as we can see here, the two commands that begin on the map, which are part of the army of the Danube, start frozen. And uh, there's no chance that they will be released until a French unit, a combat unit, not an engineering unit, a combat unit crosses the Berezina. And that will take the French some time to manage. Now the Russian units that begin on the map are not the only elements of the army of the Danube. There's a, a considerable number of forces from that army that, may, that will enter in turn number three. They will enter the map. However, entering the map and releasing them is not the same thing. You see here that these units on turn three will enter the map and they will move to empty hexes within three hexes of the earthworks at hexes 56, 14, and 57, 30. And those are the earthworks that we see here near the village of Dimki. So those units only will be released on a favorable result on the uh, Army of the Danube uh, activation table. Now, that's not the only army that is uh, looking for trouble with the French. The Russians also have Wittgenstein's army. And Wittgenstein's army starts rolling for entry during turns 12 onwards. Now, during turn 12, uh, you start rolling and it enters on a 1. On turn 13, it enters on a 1 or 2. On turn 14, it enters on a 1 to 4. And if it has not entered uh, in turn 14, in turn 15, the army of Wittgenstein uh, enters automatically, as signified here. So Wittgenstein's army will be on the board by turn 15, and it is a considerable army, as you can see here. Now, I made this uh, Russian reinforcement card to ease setup. There's two units that I couldn't figure out if they're part of Wittgenstein's army or some other army because the 
color scheme is slightly different. You see that it's a lighter brown than the color of Wittgenstein's army. I'm assuming they're part of Wittgenstein's army, so I'm including them there. But uh, these are units that on the back read guard, com, guards, and the foot unit reads Gren or Grenadier combined. So if any of you who are uh, devout Napoleonic uh, historians know to which command these units belong, let me know. Now in addition to the army of the Danube and Wittgenstein's army, there's an independent command in the game, which is Yermalov's independent command, which enters in turn 14. It consists of four units, you see them there, and this command can be attached to any of the armies during the game. So once it is attached to an army, it is moved whenever that army is moved, but it enters, those three units will enter in turn 14. So on turn 15, Wittgenstein's army, if it has not already entered, will enter. And Wittgenstein's army enters completely operational and activated. It doesn't have to roll on any table in order to uh, be released. Now, in turn 15, we also start rolling for the main army. And we roll 2d6, as stated here, on a roll of 9 or more, the avant guard of the main army enters in that turn and we would roll 1d6 to see in which hex that event guard that you see there represented by three units and the leader uh, enters and let's say that the event guard entered in turn let's say 16 then during the next turn which would be 17 then the remainder of the main army would enter and we're talking about these three Russian corps. We have the uh, third corps under Stroganov, the fourth corps under Osterman, and the fifth corps under Lavrov. And of course, you have the commander of the main army, Kutuzov, also entering the game. So, one really cool aspect of this game is that it is not heavily scripted. The entry of the Russian armies is variable. All armies uh, have specific rules of how they may enter play. The army of the Danube uh, may enter but it may still be frozen and it has to uh, uh, become released in order to attack French units. And then you have Wittgenstein's army which can enter anytime from t turn 12 to 15. And then you have uh, uh, Kutuzov's main army to worry about from turn 15 onwards and the game lasts up to 25 turns. We see here the turn record track on the left hand side of the map. We see uh, that it begins here in turn 1 and these uh, turns that you see in light blue are day turns and uh, it's four day turns and each uh, represents a passage of four hours and then you have two night turns so we start in november 25 and we move all the way to november 29 so turn 25 is the last turn of the game i mean it can it can uh end before if the uh, french evacuate all their units but it is a game that can last up to 25 so let's set up the uh, starting French forces. That's Oudinot's second corps. They set up within two hexes of uh, any hex of Borisov, east of the Berezina. So now we'll set up the French in Borisov. That's Oudinot's second corps with an eye on moving the engineers. And so we'll set up the engineers in these hexes here which are the hexes that are closest to where we want to send them. And uh, the engineers, of course, have to rush to the Ford hex sides. So we will start by placing uh, the Eble counter here. And the other engineer counter will be also in the same hex. Now, 
we will be using these wooden tiles to signify that combat units are carrying treasure. So we will place uh, these uh, wooden tiles beneath each of the combat units. The engineers are considered combat units also. So we have set up the engineers and now we'll set up the rest of the forces which is Udino's second corps. Here we have uh, the units of Udino's second corps set up and you can tell they're ready to move north which is in this direction here in order to uh, march on the uh, uh, Ford hex side that appears the best uh, choice for now which is that which is between hexes 4215 and 4315 and note that we placed these uh, wooden tiles beneath each of the combat units to signify that they are carrying treasure so we're ready to begin and let's play turn one we're going to use this deck of uh, sequence of play cards so let's flip the first card and it is check for reinforcements there's no reinforcements in turn one however if we're playing with the optional rule regarding random events we would now roll 1d6 and only on a six then we roll on the random events table so uh, let's roll 1d6 to see if we have a random event the roll is a four no random event next is the morale effects phase and here we would place any uh, bridge finis marker for any bridge that has been finished but we don't have that situation and for each french combat unit on the map we would now roll on the french morale effects table but as you see in the yellow band at the top we skip that in turn one so we have nothing else to do the russian morale track is at its starting point so we go to the next phase and it's the french movement phase so we moved french combat units and leaders first and then we would move french rabble but we don't have any rabble uh, counters on the map and there's a minus two penalty for units that cannot trace a command uh, path of three uh, movement points or less to their commanders at this time all of Udino's units can so they'll be able to move their full movement allowance and the engineer units do not belong to any command so they can always move their full movement allowance of five so here we see the positions of the units before movement and here we see the position of the French units after movement the cavalry of the second corps has a uh, uh, road ahead and uh, they are advancing towards the uh, intended area which will be here this uh, Ford hex side and we have the rest of the units with some infantry units and we have the engineer units followed by the rest of Udino's corps including the artillery uh, core artillery so they are on the march and uh, notice they are strung one per hex because in this game there is a road stacking limit of not more than one combat unit plus any number of leaders so uh, if units wish to move along the road or trail at the road uh, or trail rate which is for roads uh, a third of movement point and trails half a movement point uh, they cannot be stacked so next would be the first joint combat phase there's no units of the French adjacent to Russian units so there's no combat no artillery bombardment the next card would be uh, the Russian movement phase but both uh, Russian commands from the army of the Danube that are on the map are frozen so we also skip this phase so there's not going to be any second joint 
combat phase. Then uh, the next phase would be the engineering phase, where French engineers can roll on the engineering table to try to construct uh, these pontoon bridges, but they haven't arrived yet at the location where that would happen. And then the last phase is the bridge breakdown phase. We have no bridges so far, so that's the end of the first. And now we would proceed to turn to November 25, 0800 out. So we start by rolling for a random event, only on a 6 would we roll on the random events table, and we have a 6. So now we roll 2d6 on the random events table, and on a result of a 7, it would be no event. So let's roll both dice, and the roll is a 5. So it's event D, Russians deceive. During the next Russian movement phase, we remove all Army of the Danube cavalry units from play, which are not currently in enemy zones of control. However, we treat this as a no event if the Army of the Danube has not yet been released, and that is the case. It hasn't been released. It is still frozen, so this is a no event. But it would have been great to get rid of all that Russian cavalry, but... It's not the case. Now we go to the morale effects phase. We're in turn two, so now there's no uh, bridges to uh, complete. For each Fre French combat unit that's on the map, and we start in the southeast corner, moving west, we roll 2d6 on the French morale effects table, and we stop rolling if a natural four or less is rolled. Let's check that table out. Here we see the French morale effects table and uh, we would roll two dice for each of the combat units on the map and we start in a certain direction from the southwest corner of the map and we proceed one by one rolling 2d6 and we check the unit's combat rating so you see that units that have higher combat ratings have a better chance of that dot result which is what we're looking for no effect and, of course, if we roll a natural four or less, this process stops. And there's some modifiers. We subtract one if the unit is stacked with its core leader or Napoleon. We subtract one if the unit is presently west of the Berezina, which is not the case right now. They're all east. And we stop rolling, as stated before, if a natural dice roll of four or less occurs. We will film this particular phase so that you have an idea of what it looks like. It ha it's a lot of dice rolling because you're supposed to do this every turn and there's 25 turns and that's uh, uh, one criticism of the game. The game has a, an alternate uh, table where you roll just once per phase and remove uh, a specific amount of uh, treasure and also step losses, but we will use this one in this video. So we start checking from the southeast corner of the board. This is the southeast corner because north is this way. So we would check first on this row. There's nothing. And of course, we would start checking this unit first and moving on in this direction. So we will roll for that first French infantry unit. It is a B-type unit. So we'll place a post for the unit that we will be rolling uh, for. So here we have a uh, morale effects table, which I cut out, and we will be rolling for that first unit. The unit has a combat rating of B. The roll is a 6, no effect. We roll for the next unit, which is also a B-type unit. The roll is a 7 AT. That means that the unit sheds its treasures. So we eliminate the wooden tile and we place this abandoned treasure marker beneath the unit to note that it has abandoned its treasure. We roll for the next unit, a B-type unit, a 6, no effect. For the artillery unit, we rolled a 12. So that unit has a step loss. 
and units can take up to four steps of loss so we signify the step loss by placing the step loss marker beneath the unit it still has its treasures but it has a step loss the next unit is an infantry unit it rolled an eight it also sheds its treasures now we roll for the next infantry unit which is also b type and the roll is a 9, it abandons also its treasures. And now we roll for the next infantry brigade, and that one is stacked with the core commander, Udino. So there's a minus 1 die roll modifier. The roll is an 8 modified to a 7, so that unit also loses its treasures. And now we roll for the Chassiloup engineering unit, and that one has a rating of C. And the roll is a 9. It suffers a step loss. So that's not good because that's a very valuable engineering unit. And now we roll for a Blaze engineering unit, which also is a C-type. And the roll is a 6. It abandons its treasures. Now we roll for the uh, Infantry Brigade, which has a combat rating of B. The roll is a 9, it also abandons its treasures. Now we roll for the remaining B-type infantry unit. A 10, and it also abandons its treasures. And now we roll for the two cavalry units, the one closest to the uh, river there. And we roll a 2, that's, that's uh, within that range which is four or less so it's no effect and that's the end of the morale uh, effects table rolling during this turn so just one unit didn't get checked which is the lead French cavalry unit. so during this turn a total of six units abandoned their treasures and we had uh, one casualty and that was taken by one of the engineering units now bear in mind that if you obtain an abandoned treasure result and the unit has already abandoned its treasures, it's treated as a step loss result. So this French morale effects table is brutal. So next comes the French movement phase. Okay, so uh, here we see that Udino is here and he can... Uh, uh, cause that each of these units move to their full movement allowance because they are within three movement points of course by using the trail uh, movement bonus as well as up to here with these units cavalry units however are not within three movement points of Udino so they will suffer a minus two uh, to their movement allowance so they can move up to six movement points and here we see the positions of the Russian uh, French second corps after movement and also uh, the two engineering units and as was the case with the prior turn there's no combat phase no Russian movement phase because both commands are frozen no second joint combat phase no engineering phase and no bridge breakdown phase. So now we move on to turn 3, November 25, 1200 hours. And there's going to be French and Russian reinforcements entering during this turn. Let's first roll for a possible random event. And the roll is a 4, no random event. And as stated before, there's French reinforcements coming in during this turn. And also, the remaining units of the army of the Danube. The French reinforcements are Napoleon and the Old Guard with its leader Lefebvre and they will enter the map during the French movement phase. And the Russians have uh, Admiral Chichagov with uh, leader Voinov and the remaining units of the army of the Danube. They will enter during the Russian movement phase, but they will not be released. They have to move uh, towards uh, the earthworks at hexes 5614 and 5713. 
And now, of course, we have the dreaded morale effects phase, where we check for morale uh, now. And uh, we will do this off camera, and then I will let you know what the result of the French morale check was. And curiously enough, starting with the first unit to be checked, which is this uh, French infantry division belonging to the second corps, the roll was a two. So no other effect on French morale will occur this turn. So the French were extremely lucky. Now we checked for command control for the French units. And that has an impact on the upcoming French movement phase. And you see that all French units that you see on the screen are within three movement points of leader Oudinot. And that includes these second core units here and all second core units to the rear. On to the French movement phase. So we move French units and we will move Oudinot's second core and the engineer units and then we will enter the reinforcements. This is the position before movement. Here are the positions of the French units after movement. Notice that Eble has made it to the hex on the east side of the Berezina that shares that Ford hex side. So he will be rolling on the engineering table this turn. The other engineering unit, Chasseloup, has been sent further north in case Eble's efforts fail. So uh, he can try to uh, see if he can establish a bridge here in these northernmost Ford hex sites. So it will take a while for him to get there. Now we enter the turn three reinforcements for the French, Napoleon and the Old Guard. We see Napoleon in hex 6005 with one of the units of the Old Guard. And now we will conduct the movement of the French Emperor and the units of the Old Guard. And here we see the final positions after moving into Borisov and we also added the uh, loot wooden tiles beneath each of the combat units. Go to the first joint combat phase. There's no combat, so we skip that. And then we go to the Russian movement phase and we have to enter the Russian reinforcements. And these units of the Army of the Danube enter the map at hex 6012 and they have to move to empty hexes within three hexes of the earthworks at hexes 5614 and 5713. So here we see their entry point. It's marked by that pawn here, hex 6012. And it also has that bugle symbol because it serves as an exit point for French units. So we've lined up the Russian units. And I think that not all of them are going to be able to enter this turn. And why is because their movement ratings are very low, the lowest in the game when the marker is here in the Russian morale track in the starting box. Foot units have one movement point, cavalry units two. There's a special rule that applies to all Russian combat units. They cannot end a movement phase more than four hexes away from some leader in their formation. And you see that the Army of the Danube has various leaders. There's two on the map, Langeron and Chlaplatz. And with these reinforcements, there's two more, Chichagov and Voinov. So that requirement uh, is not hard to meet because there's many leaders, but there cannot be a Russian unit uh, more than four hexes away from its leader. So you cannot move units so that they end up beyond this four uh, hex range. <clears throat> so now we'll enter the Russian reinforcements. This is the position before movement. These are the positions after movement. Notice that the foot units were not able to enter the map, so they will continue to enter in the next turn, which is turn four. 
second joint combat phase there is no combat so now we move on to the engineering phase here French engineer combat units may attempt to construct or repair pontoon bridges over the Berezina and we would roll 2d6 on the engineering table and apply the results and looking at the way that these abandoned treasure markers operate I think it's easier just to remove them once a unit sheds its treasure for example here we see that this unit shed its treasure so we just removed them and we leave them somewhere on the map and each one of these will cost the French a minus one victory point penalty so we will remove these uh, abandoned treasure markers and place them to the side and those units that still have their treasure will be signified by having the wooden block or a tile beneath their counter. And now to the uh, attempt by Eble to build the bridge over the Beresina. Now, Eble has to complete the bridge on both sides of the Beresina, starting with the east side. And when he completes the bridge, uh, that is signified by these uh, triple B markers, like the one that you see here. Then he has to ford the Berezina, rolling on the ford crossing table, and then uh, complete the same process on the other side. Okay, so here we have the engineering table. And uh, what we have to check here is the distance between where the engineer unit is and the closest Russian unit in number of hexes. So the closest Russian units are these that are near uh, Borisov. So let's count the number of hexes to this particular Russian uh, group of Russian units. And it is 12. So we use the rightmost column, which is the 9 plus column, which is the best column, actually. So we would have to roll 2d6, and we need to obtain these... Uh, B results, obviously uh, the more, the merrier. So uh, let's roll 2d6 and another 2, so no Bs. So uh, it's a wasted turn and that's unfortunate for the French. So they have to roll again in the next turn. So you can see that the French have to obtain three Bs in order to finish the bridge on one side then cross to the other side and obtain three B's also. So it's a process that will definitely take some time. So that would be the engineering phase, then we would have the bridge breakdown phase, if we would have a bridge operational, but we don't. So that would be the end of the third turn. Now I'm not going to keep on playing the game, I think you have an idea of movement, of how bridges are constructed, now I just want to give you an example of uh, the combat system. It is very simple. And uh, let's take a look at how combat works. Units fire sequentially. A units first, followed by B units, then C, and then D units. Now let's take a look at how the combat system works. Let's set up some units and resolve a combat situation. Okay, let's say it's the second uh, combat, uh, joint combat phase, and the you know, Russians are attacking here, and uh, we'll start with a ranged fire attack, and we have an artillery unit, which is two hexes away from this infantry unit that belongs to um, Davu's first corps, and it is in a woods hex. Artillery units can fire up to three hexes away, so this one is two hexes away. So first let's check the Russian morale track to see what uh, combat strengths the Russian units have in this situation. So here we see that the marker is in the number five box, so Russian units have a combat strength of C. Now the artillery will only fire 
at this unit and of course this unit doesn't fire back. Here we see the combat's results table. The artillery would roll on the C row and hits with five or six. Notice that there are modifiers for artillery, artillery firing at a range of one hex. It would be a plus one or artillery firing at the maximum range of three hexes. Also, there's a modifier for the terrain that the defender occupies, the wooded terrain. And here we see that the die roll modifier in combat is minus one. So we roll on the C row, 1d6 with a minus one. And the roll is a three modified to a two, so that's a miss. Now we resolve the combat situation here we have three Russian units one has one step loss they all have the rating indicated in the Russian morale table C and they're attacking this hex that has two French units and a leader let's spread the units out so that you can see we have Davu and we have one full strength French unit there is a reduced step French unit which already has one hit, one more hit, and it is gone. The French only have a C-type unit, and then it has to designate its target. It will fire at the top unit here in this hex, which is a clear terrain hex. So it needs five or six. However, there is a plus one die roll modifier because the leader is stacked with the unit from its same command. So it's a five or six, but we roll and there's a plus one. So the roll is a five modified to a six, and that is a hit inflicted on the top Russian unit. Now the Russians fire with their C-type units, which are all three, and they have to designate their targets. This unit will fire at this reduced D-strength unit and uh, both of these units will fire at the full strength C type unit. So we'll start with this unit here that has a step loss. The Russians are firing at a unit that is located in a woods hex. All these units, French units, are in a wood hex, so that's a minus one. And the Russians need five or six. The roll is a two, so that's a miss. Now we have the top unit here firing at the full strength C type unit. Again, five or six, but there is a minus one because of the wood terrain. Roll is a five modified to a four, no effect. Now the bottom unit fires. And again, the roll is a five modified to a four, no effect. Finally, it's the D type uh, French units turned to fire. Uh, the C-type fired at the top unit in the clear hex. Now this D unit will fire at the bottom unit. And this is a D-type unit. So it only hits with a 6, but there's a plus 1 because it is stacked with its commanding officer. So we roll 1D6. And the result is a 3. Modified to a four, and that's a miss. And that's the end of this particular combat situation or situations. You saw the ranged fire attack. So you can see that combat here is pretty attritional because all units uh, can absorb up to four step losses, and they can only inflict one per combat situation. Here we saw three Russian units attacking two French units and uh, they uh, did not inflict any any losses on the French unit. The French, uh, one of the French units did inflict a loss on the Russian unit. So this is Napoleon at the Berezina, volume one, number four, from Against the Odds magazine, published in 2003, designed by Rob Markham. And uh, we're reaching the end of this video. It's been an hour long, more or less, and I hope it gives you an idea of what this game has to offer. I think it can tell a very powerful story. The attrition obviously is gonna favor the French as they march uh, towards the Berezina. 
uh, they will be losing uh, treasure and losing also uh, strength points. And then they'll have to contend with the Russians waiting on the other side. So I hope that this video has given you a good idea of what this game is about. And this is Stuka Joe signing off for now. Thanks for watching.